You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hey, happy Friday, everybody. Welcome to TV Guidance Counselor. I am Ken Reed, your TV Guidance Counselor, and today we have a very special episode. Uh, some of you have already heard it because you were there in person. This is our live edition of TV Guidance Counselor from SF Sketch Fest in San Francisco with my guest Frank Portman, also known as Dr. Frank of the excellent band, The Mr. T Experience. He is also an author, uh, written, I think, three books now, King Dork approximately, being probably his most well-known, and if you are tuning into the show because you are a fan of Frank's, you have great taste, and welcome. If this is the first episode you've heard, this is a show where I, being Ken Reed, have every issue of TV Guide. Somebody picks an old edition, they go through it, they write down what they would watch that week, and then we discuss their choices, and that's what we did with Frank at Piano Fight in San Francisco. I want to thank Frank for doing the show. I've been a huge fan of his for uh, actually decades, which is odd, is an odd thing to say. I, I feel like I'm not that old, but apparently I am. Um, and, uh, that's a little bit disheartening, but he is fantastic, great author, fantastic musician, really like talking to him. And I want to thank Sketchfest for having me. This was the first time I've ever done Sketchfest. Uh, did a lot of great shows, uh, did Corey Sklar's show, which was fantastic on Saturday. Got to see the kids in the hall do a live reading of Brain Candy, which is one of my absolute favorite all time movies. And I got to do this show. And some of you have already heard it because you were there. And I cannot thank you enough for coming out. It was great to meet you. As always, it still amazes me that people listen to the show. And it's great that you came out and you said hello. It was great to meet you guys. And I loved talking to you. Thank you so much for doing that. If you haven't heard the show because you weren't one of those people, you're about to now. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy our live TV guidance counselor from SF Sketchfest with Frank Portman, Dr. Frank. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, mostly the same people who were here 10 minutes ago when we uh, sound check. But thank you guys for coming out to TV Guidance Counselor Podcast. Uh, my name is Ken Reed. Uh, I don't know. Has anyone ever heard the show? Who's here? Oh, cool. Oh, well, my wife has. Um, <laughs> thank you guys for coming out. Uh, the, the concept of this show, I'm a comedian from Boston, and I... Uh, have an unnatural, unusual uh, affliction. Affliction? Is that like a, an affliction that is an affection? Uh, affliction for TV Guide, I, I own more or less every issue. Uh, someone picks an old issue, we go through what they would watch that week in history, and that's essentially the podcast. So this week my guest is Mr. Frank Portman, everybody. Please welcome Frank. <laughs> local, local talent done good? Yeah, uh, done medium. <laughs> He's an author. Uh, uh, you may know him from his band, The Mr. T Experience, as well, um, which is fantastic. So when I asked you kind of what years you were looking, you were thinking mid-70s. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm old enough that that was my heyday, was the mid-70s. <laughs> mid I think, 70s. you know. I was, I, I was in my prime in 1975. 1975. It's all been downhill since then. So this is 1976, so it was a year after your prime. Right. Um, I was starting to feel the years. So this is... Point. The, the centennial. Uh, and I find that most people end up watching the most television usually between ages like 8 and 12 because you're, you're old enough to have your own taste, but you're not old enough to go out and do anything. <laughs> so, in, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. And so you grew up in the East Bay? Is that I, well, I grew up, I was born, I was a San Francisco native. I'm actually the only one of them I know or have ever met. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, I, I, so I was born in this city and then... Uh, at a certain point, my family moved to the peninsula, and so I grew up in the suburbs there. But, but my relationship with television uh, surprises people when they hear about it because I'm very much very associated with TV because of my band and uh, was sort of very pop trash, culture -y. pop culture, trash TV focused and, and such. But my parents were very opposed to television when I, when I was a kid, and they weren't, they weren't hippies. They were very clean cut liberals but they thought that they banned television like they banned a lot of things like sugar and salt and all the, you know, all the good things. So it's like living in Footloose. <laughs> it, it, it was, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but the thing that I discovered at, at one point, I mean, I, I, I grew to an age where I was able to feel the lack of it because I was unable to relate to any of my peers. Television was the only, it was a sh you know, the only shit was our 
shared experience that you had. But the guy across the street, Mike Jensen, lived with his two grandmothers, which is, I just realized when I was thinking about this, how weird that is. Gra <laughs> Grandma Edna and Grandma Jean, and then he, he lived there, and um, they were very nice ladies, and I used to go over to his house to watch television, and they were very nice. You'd sit on the, well, the, the old ladies in those days had very unusual names for the couch. It was either the Chesterfield or the Davenport, so I'd be on... Is that the brand name of the couch? I'd be on the, on the Davenport, and they'd come in with <laughs> cookies and everything, and we'd just spend... 100% of our time watching television, even to the point where I would go over to Mike Jensen's house, you know, 6 a.m. in the morning before anybody was awake because I wanted to watch uh, Lilius Yoga and You. Or um, <laughs> they had a they had a game, an agricultural college game show called Agriculture USA that was on Sunday morning at like you know 6 a.m. Was it a quiz and, show of agriculture? Yes, or was, was it like make those beans grow? It Who's was a it was a, it was a quiz show, and they would have a panel of, uh, of students from, say, you know, UC Davis Al Agricultural College and some other agricultural college, and they would answer questions about agriculture. <laughs> and uh, I was really, I really liked it. I don't know why. <laughs> but I liked it because I was, I, because it was banned. <laughs> yeah, so you, I, anything you could get. And the, and the Grandma Jean and Grandma Edna were really um, accommodating. They'd wake up and they'd see me there watching the Ag USA and they would say, oh, good morning. And they would, you know, <laughs> come and bring me snacks and, and so forth. So uh, my, my parents didn't figure out that I had, was cheating on the television. What did they um, think you were doing with <laughs> Grandma Edna and Grandma G? Yeah, they, they, did. well, they, <laughs> they didn't know about it. And my mother tried to do um, this thing where she would, uh, she, I, they didn't ban me from going there, but she tried to take the TV schedule and mark off the things I was able to watch at Grandma Jean's and Grandma Edna's Just house. Just in case you happen but, to see yeah, it. Yeah, but it never, it never, and, and it would, she would, she would cross, the things she would cross out were funny, you know, uh, there's the sexy things that like love American style and, um, and uh, the, I think, I mean, I think the Partridge family was also because they, um, because that was sort of a hippie show as well. Oh, yeah. Which I was uh, actually a bit frightened of the Partridge family. I was too. Yeah. No, I was. Reuben Kincaid was terrifying. Because that man, like, something about him was yeah. super creepy. And he wasn't in a relationship with uh, Carolyn uh, Jones. What's her first name? Uh, Shirley Jones. Shirley Jones. But he was just kind of always hanging around. He was like a store brand Van Patten. Like, he yeah. wasn't quite Dick Van Patten. It was like, it was like, oh, I asked for Dick Van Patten for Christmas. And. You gave me Reuben Kincaid. Well, I was terrified of hippies because um, of the Charles of Manson family. And I just always had this idea that I was going to get kidnapped and given drugs and turned into a zombie and made to, to kill Sharon Tate or whatever <laughs> they, whatever they made you, make you do. So I, and I, I, as a kid, I thought that the Partridge family was a bit like that. Because of the bus problem. But I loved it. I mean, that's it. And because they were a little, they were the hit, they, they had the music, the incidental music instead of the Brady Bunch music by Frank Duvall was very um, uh, kind of uplifting. And even yeah. when it was sad, it was a little bit. Um, wah, 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 wah. Yeah. The Partridge family had that kind of, you know, wah, 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 which I associated with some, you know, kind of scary stuff like the Zodiac Killer. So I was. Um, I was I was frightened, but yet strangely compelled. I really want to see a TV movie about the Zodiac Killer, starring David Cassidy. Yeah, I would watch. But that. David Cassidy now. Right. <laughs> yeah, I saw him play in the '90s, um, and it was one of the greatest shows I've. Was it really I've good? Ever seen. It was really really good. Yeah. I, uh, that's when we started getting all that 70s nostalgia stuff. Yeah, the Brady no, Bunch no, movie, and uh, he was in a movie called The Spirit of 76, yeah, uh, yeah. which is a fantastic movie. Um, but a friend of the show, Olivia Dabo, is in that movie, and she was telling me that he, he brought all his own wardrobe to that movie, like platform boots and everything. Mm. And she was like, oh, that's great, because you were around then, and it's authentic. He's like, no, I rent them, my wardrobe, and it's a way to get more money for being in the movie. You, Bring your own clothes and then you rent them. <laughs> Did to this you see the, 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 the news story recently about how he had to? I don't know what happened with this, but he was losing his big house in Florida. Like no. he was, had fallen on hard times, and so he was going through this gigantic, you know, mansion in Florida, and he had to sell it, and he had to sell all his stuff. But he was keeping his guitar because it meant something. He was like hugging his guitar. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what happened. I but like, do you remember a TV show that he was in, David Cassidy, Man Undercover? 
No. Which was which was a kind of the Twenty One Jump Street um, sort of format, where he his youthful he was a police officer with a youthful appearance that allowed him to pass as a high school student, and he would bust them for drugs. I already love this, and again yeah. want to see this remade, but with David Cassidy now. Yeah. <laughs> like seven year old. And Cassidy. I gotta say, in the mid '90s, he was still had a youthful appearance. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. He's he's aged beyond his years recently. But uh, the the two grandmas. Let's go back to that for one moment. <laughs> yeah. Now, were they a couple, or were they his see, parents who their grandfathers had died, yeah, and they kind of golden see, girls? Now, now that I am, I'm speaking it aloud. I'm realizing maybe there was more to that relationship than I assumed, because that is a really weird, uh, weird thing to do. He, he but he, is, he, he came from a difficult uh, situation because I know there was one time in my in my uh, relationship with him. Uh, where his father came to visit, and it was this big deal, and he gave him some love beads, and oh. that was like that was the that it was actually very poignant. I yeah. even realized it was poignant. Yeah. So this is like this one interaction with his with his father, but it's mostly it was the grandmas. Right. But I think they were really were grandmas. Huh. Yeah. I, I would. I think we could pitch this show and sell it uh, <laughs> yeah. today. Um, I, I would used watch to, it. My neighbor. I used to walk to school when I was five or six years old, which is crazy. Like if I think of a five or six year old where I'm like, go just walk two miles uh, to a place. We hope you get there. And if you're not home at three, then we'll worry tomorrow. But, uh, and so I was the first house on this dead end street and I would go kind of pick up the other kids that we walked to school together. And uh, the first house was this kid, Chuck Perkins. And I used to get to his house a good hour before he needed to leave. And I used to sit at their kitchen table and read the newspaper <laughs> while his dad was like getting ready for work. And I ran into his, just like a six year old being like, oh, let's look at the stocks. And, <clears throat> and I always remember he used to eat grape nuts with water instead of milk, which is still really, wow. yeah. Like how is it like grape nuts are, are bad anyway. But to be like, how can I make these worse? Water. Um, but I ran into this kid, Chuck's sister, recently, and she's like, yeah, my parents thought it was great that you're a comedian now because they remember you coming over in the morning and you would read the paper and then do political jokes. <laughs> I was like, what? She's like, yeah, my dad said you had the, the best just political humor and he would retell the jokes. And I'm like, I was six years old and I would read the paper and make political jokes. And I realized I was a really weird kid. That was not a normal thing. That was uh, like so much eccentricity rolled into one little ball. Yeah. In that anecdote. Can you imagine like just you're at home and some six year old comes around and be like, hey, can I read the paper? Geez, can you believe this election? And you're like, I don't understand what's wrong with you, but. Right, yeah, well, my, my parents finally rented a, a little black and white TV so that they could uh, watch Watergate. That was the. Really, that, that was, was the thing that That was, that that was the thing that broke the, the barrier. And then after that, they had given up, and then it was all. Then, then, then gra the grandmas were no longer necessary. Right, and then I, I kicked the grandmas to the curb. Were you watching Watergate with them? Like, did oh yeah, I loved that show. <laughs> I, it was great. No, it, it was it was great, and I used to do imitations of it, Mr. Dean, yeah. Mr. Haldeman. I mean, I don't. Even, I to this day, I don't even really grasp uh, the the sound bites that I remember. Even I know the gen the general outlines of it. I was. Um, I mean, my parents, of course, hated Nixon, um, as you do. Yeah, as I, people do. But I, I, you know. Uh, being a contrarian kind of felt a sort of affection for him as a child like I you know and that has lasted to this day he's a poignant tragic figure in a lot of ways and um, and it and it, it it's carried this uh, carried through to the rest of my work. <laughs> it's all influenced by Nixon. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, so you sort of Alex P. keaton yourself, uh, to sort of in a, in a yeah, retaliation. There, there was something of that dynamic, and if you if you grew up in the Bay Area without a little bit of that, then there then I wonder what yeah you know, because uh, we there, there were uh, I, all of my all of my teachers and all of my uh, parents and you know priests and cops and everything it was all. Question authority, question authority. So <laughs> if you were really going to follow that, you would you would take a much different path than the than the way that uh, like the, some you know. cops like, hey kid, what are you doing? They're like, I'm sorry, officer, wrong answer. Tell me to go fuck myself. <laughs> You're going into the clink. 
Yep, ex ex exactly my point. <laughs> but there were a bunch of shows sort of set in San Francisco, like Streets of San Francisco probably being the most prominent one, but you had in the late 80s Midnight Caller, which was yeah. uh, hilarious because all the comedians who were in uh, San Francisco at the time showed up on that show in some way. Like Greg Proops was a cab driver at one point. Right. <laughs> Midnight Caller. Yeah, Streets of San Francisco made a big impression on me because I knew it was San, San Francisco and everything, but actually it was a very... Uh, I don't, I don't want to say accurate, but the feel of it, the way it looked, that kind of shabbiness and the muted light and everything and the sh sort of junky sedans pulling up to the curb and knocking the garbage can over um, was very much, I mean, that's kind of what San Francisco is like a little bit now still. And then I, I just remember the scene where the car would, you know, skid to the curb, the door would open, and the legs would get out and they'd be these, you know, men's sort of, droopy, uh, rumpled uh, slacks. trousers, <laughs> slacks from the knees down. And, then, and it was a, that, that was the same view I had of my father, my, you know, this <laughs> the eye line of his knee down of this rumpled. And then it's like, then it'd, be, it'd get out, and then it'd be Carl Malden, and uh, he would be in a rumpled uh, car, guy in a raincoat and the rumple. And it was just like, this is like, this is, it, this, all these shows, not just Streets of San Francisco, if you want to say Quincy or Columbo or, uh, or any of those shows, they're just like, they were all my dad, but they were solving crimes. <laughs> what did your dad do for work? He was a general contractor. Okay. So <laughs> he died, I never, buy this show. <laughs> never, never solved a crime in a, a, that I ever knew of, but I still kind of did, I still kind of saw him in all those guys. I want a general contractor that solves crimes, and mm -hmm. I would 100% watch that show. It would be great, <laughs> or or that commits crimes because then he had yes. a like, easy way to dispose of. The well, body. he has a Moriarty. That's his like his contracting rival who's always bidding on jobs, but he's also a murderer. Right. Well, I, I, <laughs> he'd have a, the hard hat. He'd be supervising the concrete pour, and then there'd be the body under. Yeah, him. I think that's yeah. Good. Uh, I like it. Good work. Um, <laughs> all right, please don't steal our idea, everybody. We're going to put it in an envelope and mail it to ourselves to copyright it, um, which is not legally binding. But we have the, so we have the fall preview here from 1976, so we're, this is a big deal. There's a ton of new shows here. And my favorite thing about the fall previews is that TV Guide, which used to be very literate, as we were kind of talking before the show. And astoundingly well written that I hadn't looked at a TV Guide in ever. And uh, <laughs> it, it really does put in sharp relief how, how did, what a degenerate culture we are in now. <laughs> yes. if, even the TV guide is, is shockingly well written. Yeah. That's, that's really something. I mean, even the capsule reviews of the capsule previews of the, you know, the, the reruns of movies that are on like dialing for dollars are things that I think that many people in America would not be able to grasp without <laughs> looking up you know, 10 or 11 <laughs> words. Oh yeah, I and, often have to look up words yeah. that I hear, that I read in TV Guide, which sounds embarrassing, but I'm like, oh, this has expanded my horizons. Like, I feel like half of the, the descriptions of shows, if we read them to people, uh, probably not here, but let's say in the middle of America, uh, they would be like, hey, stop being so elitist. And I'm like, I just read you a description of Gilligan's Island. <laughs> I don't know why you're <laughs> but, mad. But the thing is, you read the articles about them, and they, uh, they, the, I just was the few uh, uh, issues I was looking at um, and just paging through them, and uh, they're not just good and not just prescient. They're kind of prophetic and it, like of, of what society and media and culture is degenerated to and you think well, they knew it all along they knew oh, it yeah. back then if only we had paid attention yeah. then maybe some of this disaster could have been avoided yeah there, there's literally stuff it's always interesting to read the election ones because they're like uh the election is not entertainment if we don't stop doing this we're just gonna have television personalities lying and winning elections that's in like 1974 <laughs> there, and it's, yeah. it, it's more well written than that but one of my other favorite things is that they have the shows, the new shows that year and they always pick which ones are going to be the big hits and they're always wrong <laughs> but they, <laughs> so they write about these shows that you've never heard of along with the shows that we all are perennial favorites in the same light and for their Saturday night picks for this fall, the three shows they pick let's see if you remember any of these is a show called Holmes and Yo-Yo this is Gregory Yo-Yo Yovanovich. Like, looks like a cop, walks like a cop, and talks like a cop. Except every once in a while, he repeats himself like a broken record. Or does a backflip when somebody uses a remote control garage door. Yo-Yo, you see, is a robot. A computer in the shape of a man. <laughs> 
This was their pick for Saturday yeah, nights. I, I do remember that. I, do, I don't remember ever watching the show. I do remember the, the ads for it. Holmes and Yo-Yo. Holmes and Yo-Yo. Their indeed. second pick, Mr. T and Tina. And I definitely remember that. That lasted maybe three episodes. That was uh, uh, the, the um, what was his name? You know, Pat, Al's from, yeah, from Happy, the Happy Days. Pat Morita. Um, and it was a spinoff of that. And yep. uh, it, was, it, it was a lot of, um, I think, uh, you know, that Asian ethnic household type uh, comedy has now is now a thing, but uh, oh, yeah. you know, in, in off the boat in yeah. those days it it wasn't. And uh, I mean, basically, the comedies were never funny, so there had to be a, <laughs> there had to be another reason to watch it. They would they did have odd tone shifts, and that's one of the things they talk about a lot is that sort of very special episode thing where when you're broadcasting to a whole family, you kind of have to shift your tones, and so All in the Family was was a good example of that. Mm. But you never it must have been horrific as a parent because you never knew what tone you were going to get. So if you tune into All in the Family with your kids and you're going to laugh at a, at a bigot and that's the episode where like um, where like his wife gets raped which was an episode yeah, yeah you right. know all of a sudden you're like we were going to laugh at a sitcom and now we just had a murder and a hate crime in this show and we have right. no idea and you really wouldn't know or like There's the abortion the, episode of Maude I, 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 that show that, that socially conscious Norman Lear type television show is, it's really weird that it ever happened yeah that it ever and um, I don't particularly care for it as comedy you know I mean that, that the sort of thing where you're supposed to get a lesson for it that's supposed to improve your way your, your morality or I mean that that, that, is, that that doesn't appeal to me but the fact is you can't imagine it now. Oh yeah. And if you were to imagine it now, it would be a lot more, uh, a lot worse actually, probably. <laughs> well, shows a lot kind more of, hectoring, I think. Oh, absolutely. I, those shows were not laughing at those people. You were experiencing their sort of gallows humor of having to get through a tough situation. Like yeah. Good Times, they're living in Cabrini Green, which is literally where Candyman is set. Uh, yeah. It's a very yeah. difficult part of Chicago, but they were like making it work. And now, sort of in the 90s, it was like shows are either aspirational or were laughing at poor people. Like, Look at that dumb poorie trying to think he can be a person. It's like that kind of thing where it's just like cartoonishly blue collar people failing. And it's, it's a very odd thing. Uh, and I do sort of miss those Norman Lear shows. They could get very heavy handed. Uh, I think Different Strokes was the death knell. Although uh, Netflix, I think right now, is remaking One Day at a Time. They have One Day at a Time on. Really? Uh, with, with, it's almost the same scripts. And everything, and, the, and the, probably the same pants. It's the same pants, yeah. and uh, it's the s- <laughs> uh, but I like Different Strokes was a show that had a ridiculous amount of terrifying episodes, and Mr. T guest starred on the drug episode. That's right. Uh, he That's went. Right. There's an episode with uh, Mar- uh, Arnold's bully at school called the Gooch, and uh, yes, we have the Gooches here, everybody, and he hires Mr. T to come in and beat up the Gooch for him because that's a thing you could do if you were a, a small black child owned by a rich white man in New York in the early 1980s. Um, but it was like one of the first times Mr. T was on TV. What, why did you pick Mr. T to name the group after? The, well, you know, I've been asked this question. My, the I'm name sure of my band, Mr. Question. T Experience, I've been asked this question many times, and the actual answer is shrouded in history. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I, it was the... the I've had, I have had lots of disinformational answers like to the it Joker o- over the <laughs> over the years. But basically, what it really was was uh, that we were uh, making a flyer for a show and needed to come up with a name, and were drunk enough to think that that was a good name. <laughs> <laughs> That's how Mr. T got his name, and then it stuck. Lawrence Turo. Yeah. He he wanted to be called Mr. T because he wanted everybody to address him as Mr. Yeah. Let's let show him the respect to. Uh, and he legally changed his name yeah. to first name Mr. <laughs> middle initial period or like he. This is a quote from him. He look it up. He goes, My first name is Mr. My middle name is the period thing, and my last name is T. He legally changed his name to that. His if you have the means, which is about a penny, is the means. Purchase Mr. T's autobiography. You can get the man it on with the gold. Is oh, the man with yes, the gold? Yeah, it is good. beautiful. There's like four chapters of him running through Chicago, mm-hmm. uh, housing projects, kicking in doors, <laughs> just in like cracking skulls for no reason. It's just like page after page of Mr. T bragging.
Yeah. I probably have some extra copies of that. If you <laughs> just because just because it used to be a thing where I would go to shows and people would bring them to me as a as an offering, saying, "I bet you never seen one of these before," and uh, I. I have. <laughs> but I'm sure you would pretend that you hadn't. I, I'm always very gracious to uh, <laughs> people who are playing the role of the fan in those interactions. Did Mr. Sure. T ever contact you? No, but he does, he, he was, uh, there is an uh, incident. Ladies um, and gentlemen, the incident. Where he was promoting a comic book. Yes, he, Mr. T and the T-Force. And he was, he appeared at a comic store in Santa Rosa, California, and um, the the first album of my band has a, has a picture of was sort of a, a coloring drawing, book kind yeah. of crayon colored image of a Mr. T looking figure kind of embracing tiny like diminutive uh, cartoon figures of the members of the band. So a lo uh, several kids brought these records for him to sign and, uh, he, and it apparently angered him like to be, he, he threatened to beat up the kids and everything. Yeah, I'm not So surprised. it was, it, and, and it, so fortunately someone snapped a picture of it, which we used for a poster, <laughs> uh, which was not, not of the threat. He was just looking at it in like, you know, stunned, <laughs> appalled disbelief, which is actually the, the proper response to, uh, to my music. But, I, can, uh, I can, not to one up, I can do you one better here. Okay, well, that let's hear it. That very same time, Mr. T was promoting Mr. T and the T-Force. It was from Now Comics, and Neil Adams, who did Batman, had done this comic, and it was an awful comic. Uh, but he was really promoting it desperately, and it was, I think, probably the lowest time for Mr. T. And I was 12 years old, and I had a cable access show in Melrose, Mass, where I grew up, about comic books. I would go on TV every week and talk about comics. So it was very popular uh, in middle school. And so, and I did everything myself, and Mr. T called me at home one day to get booked on the show to promote the comic book. Because he was doing, like, the East Coast, and someone had, had floated in my name. So I'm, I'm 12 years old, and I'm telling you, I came over to my dad's like, Mr. T's on the phone. And so he's like, hey, man, I want to promote my comic. So I was like, this is great, fantastic. And then he goes, there's a $50 appearance fee. <laughs> and I was like, I'm 12. That might as well be a zillion dollars. Like, I don't have, I was there, I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't have $50. And he lost his shit. Like, he went nuts. He was like, goddamn kids, don't know show. Like, he flipped out. And I was, he was threatening me, and I hung up on him. So I was 12 years old, I was being yelled at, and I hung up on him, and then later, and I used to have this phone message still, and I don't know what happened to it, but I used to play it on stage sometimes. He called and apologized and left me a message, and it was like this somber, he was like, hey, Ken, uh, it's Mr. T, I'm very sorry. But then, there's this whole thing, and then he goes, I would still need that $50. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was like a new... Well, yeah, all uh, right, so, that does that does. But it do sounds like I, I have. But it sounds like we we've noticed a pattern here. Yeah, <laughs> he was having a tough time at that time in his life. Because yeah. I always feel like if if he gave you crap, you could be like, we're talking about Mr. T from the Pat Morita show, <laughs> and Pat Morita's totally cool with it. So how dare you, Mr. T? That's a good idea. <laughs> if he comes, and gets I'm going to tell my lawyer that. <laughs> so this is also the year that Quincy premiered, which we were talking about here. Uh -huh. And uh, so when you were growing up and you were kind of, you were into punk rock and stuff, were you, were you watching any of the punk rock scare episodes, like that infamous Quincy episode? Well, I mean, I, I did watch, I, did, I do remember that episode and I was very, I was interested in, uh, in punk rock uh, at that time, although... Um, that was a little bit of a delay. I don't know what date that is. This, this, this is 76, but 76. the punk rock scare episode, I think, was like 83 or Yeah, it was a bit, a bit uh, you know, uh, subsequent <laughs> yes. to, when, uh, to when that. But I, I remember, so I remember when people were talking about that was when I was in college. And um, I was in my, the dorm that I lived in, in in college. I was the punk rock guy there. Um, and so people would ask me about it. Is that what it's really like, man? And, so, <laughs> and uh, you know, I heard I, I I heard that that they're not really like that. They're really um, progressive and really nice and really because there's the point where where Quincy was saying you've got to help us find this girl. Yeah. And and this dude who does not really look very punky. Just looks no. like kind of a, a, a shaggy sort of. He says, "Hey, besides, who the hell cares, man?" Yeah. And um, so, but you know, you don't really think you don't really you really do care about this missing girl, don't you? I said, "Yes, I do." 
Yes. I care deeply about this imaginary missing girl, and all of my punk rock people do as well. <laughs> I was an ambassador of punk rock at yes, uh, I, Urban I'm Hall. Sorry. Yeah. There's also uh, one of my favorites is there's a Chips episode of punk, a punk Rock Scare episode where Ponch goes undercover as a punk rocker. And there's a wonderful scene where he's practicing slam dancing in the locker room by bouncing off the lockers. It's like, hey, Ponch, what are you doing? He's like, I'm slamming, man. And it's, uh, that's exactly what it was like, everybody, if you yeah. weren't around. Uh, there was a lot of Eric Estrada's slamming. That's just, that was mostly fun. So uh, we're here in this week. Did you have something that anything popped out that you watched here or that popped out to you um, the first night on the Saturday? The first, uh, I should have taken notes. Um, it's quite all right. Saturday was Saturday. The Saturday was the Love Boat. Love night, Boat right? Fantasy yeah. Island. So right. So th that's it. Uh, the only thing I have to say about that is that uh, um, it was more watched among people of my age or more noted as a symbol of the fact that you were home on the Saturday night rather than out doing things with friends. So it's like, I, I feel like I watched a lot more of those episodes than I actually did. <laughs> like it was sort of symbol, I would, I would definitely was the person that was, was symbolized by that trope. So you wouldn't, <laughs> it wouldn't, you wouldn't want to admit to it. Like people try to make you slip up and be like, hey, did you see it last night on Fantasy Island? You're like, yeah, that episode, you're a loser. Like it would be that kind of thing? I would be more the, the person who would uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, ex exaggerate it for the glory of self-deprecation. I see. Be yeah. like, but, I'm the but fantasy it's, island but it's the, guy. It's the, it's the same thing. And I, I do, I mean, it was, it was, though both of those shows were so stupid. They were oh, yeah. like, like beyond uh, anyone if, if, who, who has never seen it. You can't describe how stupid they were. Yeah. But it was, you know, part of the, and it was humiliating to watch it. It was a, <laughs> like a personally humiliating experience to actually, to, to view it. But in some ways that's the essence of television. And I think that's something yeah. we've lost a bit. Like that now you are humiliated, but now the people on, that you're watching are humiliated and you can uh, um, look down on them. I mean, you know, I don't know what the shit, like the fat guys in the wilderness or, you yeah. know, the, 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 like you can do the 10, right. hour, 10 hours of ladies trying on wedding dresses or whatever. Yeah, like fat guys trying on wedding dresses. That's a and, good one. But, you know, at that, at that time, it was like you, your participation in this incredibly stupid thing said something about you, and you knew it even as a child, and it was very disturbing, and, <laughs> you know, you were crying inside the whole time. There and then the jokes weren't funny either. Yeah, well, it was very odd. Like, Fantasy Island always was sinister because Mr. Rourke was the devil, yeah, and I will right. go to my grave uh, believing that. And also, uh, uh, Hervé Velichez was terrifying. Uh, he was... I was frightened of him. A very well. small Frenchman who, in real life, was constantly pulling guns on people, which, if you also want to buy a biography, Hervé Velichez is this fantastic fine art painter, used to shoot people all the time. Uh, he was out of his mind. From the same village as Andre the Giant, weirdly, in France. Uh, the art, the, the expose about his uh, horrible time at Fantasy Island, that I can't remember what publication it was yeah. in, but the image of it, it burned in, is it in the Inquirer or People, yep. the, with the title, they treated, me, they treated Me Like a Monkey. Yeah, yeah, and it was, he left the show, and then he was replaced, do you remember who replaced by, him? Uh, uh, she was a blonde lady. It was, it, yep, it was replaced by Wendy Shaw, and then she quit after one season, and she was replaced by Mr. Belvedere. Is that right? Christopher Hewitt replaced her. <laughs> yeah. Really? So the last two seasons, he, I mean, he wasn't playing Mr. Belvedere. That would be yeah. great. Uh, but he was, the last two seasons of Fantasy Island, yeah, it had, it had Mr. Christopher Hewitt in the role of Belvedere. I, I <laughs> cannot believe your knowledge of television. It is, that, that is not uh, useful very to very anyone. Impressive. Um, but I do want to point out, this is uh, the Saturday morning preview is this week, and there's some pretty amazing cartoons here. Uh, this is the first year that a lot of the live-action Sid and Marty Croft shows came out, and they're on all three networks, which is pretty interesting. Mm. Uh, on CBS, they have the ISIS Shazam Hour, which was not what you think it is now. Um, this was the character Isis who was a superhero, it was a bit like Wonder Woman, and a show called Arc 2 that was a post-apocalyptic future where this, the, the final that. survivors drove around in a, a custom van. Really? That's it. And that, yeah. was a, that was a Croft show. Yeah, it was a Croft, Croft show. A Filmation and Croft worked on these shows together. Um, and then on, on ABC, we have the Croft Super Show, I starring Captain that. Cool and the Kongs. 
featuring Wonderbug, Dr. Shrinker, Electro Woman and Dyna Girl, and The Lost Saucer. I, I, the, the Electro Woman and Dyna Girl song still plays in my head. Yeah. I, well, that's a, so a lot of the Mr. Cheek Experience stuff, you guys, you, you, I, re I recall you covering several cartoon theme songs, although the only one I can think of is Speed Racer off the top of my head. Yeah, with Speed Racer we did, um, and uh, that, was what, that was a show that I, that, uh, that I will forever associate with Grandma Edna and Grandma Jean because that was the day, there was daily, all, they had the, the, all the, the block of the Japanese shows, Kimba, Kimba and Astro Boy yep. and, and Speed Racer. Uh, we, we played that song you know, it's a fun song. Oh, yeah. It's good. We did it. But, you know, not as a, not as any kind of a, you know, statement or anything. We we also did the Spider-Man theme, yep. which is a great song. Um, and I, the only thing I can say about that is uh, that it came in very handy one time uh, when my band was playing in Orange County uh, somewhere with. The mentors, which I don't know, <laughs> that's this, an the, odd people bill. Who, the people who laugh at that understand why that's funny. Was it and an it, alphabetical bill, and, and the, that's why you got stuck on the show? It just was one of those things that happened, and it was in a funny warehouse. I, uh, the, uh, if you don't know who the mentors are, don't look them up. Um, but it was just a very, un, very unlikely. Um, they were really friendly warm, nice fellows. Like, I've, 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 I, felt, I felt nothing but comedy uh, and, uh, and goodwill from them. But this venue and this uh, kind of this social milieu that the show was in was like the entire audience was Mexican gang members. <laughs> and so we, it was a warehouse or something, and we just went there, walked into it like, you know, whoa, what's going on? So um, we were told that um, before our set that we should play and, um, but that they couldn't guarantee our safety because there was going to be a, a, a rumble. I don't, know, I don't know if you call it rumble. <laughs> this is my, my background showing through. Maybe Some hepcats had yeah, a beef yeah. with <laughs> Whatever you call it. But the, the reason that, so okay, the reason we were warned and the reason we were shuttled into our van to drive away before the action happened, because we played before the mentors, was because we played the song Spider-Man, which I didn't realize at the time is very beloved among Mexican bang, uh, uh, gang members. And so we whoa, made... Whoa, wait, what? Apparently so. <laughs> it's they Morrissey it. and the Spider-Man theme song. <laughs> they love it. And after, like, after we finished playing, they all had Spider-Man tattoos and they would come up and, and you know, be speaking in Spanish. I couldn't understand and they show me the tattoo. And so it was a thing. Maybe it was that particular gang was the Spider-Man gang. <laughs> I don't know what oh, it was. Oh, those web slingers. It, yes, yes, they were particularly was, vicious. So that... Came in very handy. <laughs> um, that's what I'm saying. And and I, you know, I uh, people would often describe my band's music, the re the records, as there's a TV playing in the background through the whole thing. Because I would incorporate little bits of of stuff from TV in into the lyrics. And uh, one of our more known songs of that middle period was uh, an, a a love song that I wrote called Love American Style that incorporated bits of the of the, the song and maybe the ethos or the spirit of right. Love American Style in it. Um, and it, it was also a, a funny because the, in a way, because the audience that we were playing it for was um, not, it, that, those things that were referenced were not as present to them at all yeah. as they were to me when I was on the Davenport with Grandma Jean and Grandma <laughs> Edna. But the, then, so now they're obscure trivia questions. So you did get to watch Love American Style with them? I did, even of course. It was I, and I loved Love American Style. It was really sexy. Um, but if you look at it now, it's, you, if you hadn't had the experience of feeling that it was sexy when you were seven, <laughs> probably not sexy now, but it was Forbidden Fruit. And they had the ladies with the, you know, with the shirts that are tied up, at, you know, at the midriff oh, yeah. and everything. And, and they would tell, you know, it was like, Hee Haw also was similarly sexy yeah. because of the shirts, and um, it's a shirt-based sexy. Yeah, and and it just it it sets a it set a pattern that continues to this present day. I I loved Love American Style even though it was re really dumb. And the theme song, 
is great. Is what's your favorite TV theme song ever? Is that that might be it? Yeah. I mean, that that's that's close. Charles in Charge is really good. Yeah. Um, the new boy in the neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the, but but Love American Style is great because it has the line um, that that is I will defend your right to try, which doesn't make any sense. But I mean, when I swiped it for my song, I was, like, <laughs> I, I was able to make it say I will defend your right to cry. Which actually like is is so good that yeah. uh, I'm, I'm I'm grateful for whoever wrote that. I mean, it's probably Gary Marshall who wrote he, the lyrics. I'm sure, for he that. did everything. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, there's it's a there's a there is a uh, inadvertent depth to the lyrics and the and uh, and then you know there was the America the the, the love, uh, love America um, style. fireworks yeah. and everything. It was this, from '76. It was this year yeah. it debuted. This is how I imagined. Uh, you know, my adult life would be uh, <laughs> in Joanne Worley. Who, I'm having an affair with Joanne Worley, and then, then uh, the, the, there's a knock on the door, and she says, "It's my husband." And they say, "How do you know?" Well, I, it's, he always uses the door key. I mean, it's all these things <laughs> you gotta that, hide in the hamper. that happen in later life that you first get to try out in your mind through shows like Love American Style. Yeah. It's a very important part of growing up. And that's every day is like a Love American Style today? I wish, but, <laughs> but, um, but you know, to, to a degree. Yes. Uh, to a degree. I mean, it, it's, it's equal parts disappointment and, uh, and fulfillment. <laughs> I feel like that would be a lyric to a TV theme song now if we still had them. <laughs> <laughs> Equal parts it is, disappointment. It is really sad that we don't have those. It, is, it does bother yeah. me that we don't have TV theme songs anymore. And it, I mean, part of it's nostalgia and the shows I grew up with had them. But also it sort of set a tone where you could kind of ease into a show. And sort of cold open shows now are those shows where the theme song is just like a one note musical sting. I feel like shocked not like offended, but I'm like, what? What's happening? Like right. I need like that, like that sorbet of of the theme song to cleanse me into the next half hour. But one of the things about speaking of theme songs, one of the the lessons about songwriting. I mean, this, to to like I, this might this is going to get into some pretentious territory. Oh no, that's but what one, we do here. But one of the lessons about songwriting that I did learn um, is uh, from the um, the Sherwood Schwartz television shows where the theme songs would, um, would announce the premise in very great detail, but then you would wait the punchline and in a song, you, you, do, you do the setup and then there's the punchline when you, when you reveal your twisted take on the conventional things that you've introduced, and this is what the, my, my favorite kinds of songs do this, and the songs I try to write do this, and this is exactly what it was. He, the, I mean, think of the Gilligan's Island theme song, where uh, you think that he doesn't mean it, where he, he's uh, telling the story he's setting up, and he means it to be, in all seriousness, a microcosm of, a, of the world, of, of the universe that he's showing the dynamic of actual life that occurs when all these different kinds of people are in, are, are in one. And so it's the, it's the experience of watching the show that provides the final oomph, kind of like, you know, the final chorus of the George Jones song or, or right. et, et cetera. And the, the, you know, the Brady Bunch as well. And what, what, what it, the thing that is cool about it that you don't have now, and you didn't have in a lot of TV shows, in fact, were, it, it was so specific to the actual thing that was being presented. Oh, yeah. It, and and uh, it, would, it makes it into a grander artistic uh, production uh, than, than most people would give it credit for. It's a production value that they hired someone to write a song if, just about, they commissioned a song. If you didn't have the song, you wouldn't have the same show. That's my contention anyway. Because you have a bunch of shows in the 80s that the theme songs charted in the pop charts, like Cheers mm. and, and mm. the Golden Girls and Greatest American Hero and Miami Vice. But the most of those were existing songs. So like the Golden Girls theme was a hit song in the 70s. Uh, and people forgot about it. It was not written for that show. But uh, the weirdest one to me is The Greatest American Hero. That is really weird. That show is not, th that song is not thinly veiled in any way. It is no way could be about nothing but that show. It's, it's just such a bizarre thing. And it was a huge pop hit for like six months. Yeah, and, and horrible, like detestable. Like I, <laughs> I, I mean, I, that show was 
was really stupid as well. <laughs> that, that, that show might top the list of stupidest shows. I oh, mean, I don't know. Uh, the same year, and uh, not to get political here, but hey, we're in San Francisco, everybody. Um, that same year that Greatest American Hero debuted, uh, NBC debuted a show called Mr. Mr. Smith. And this is a real show. Does anyone know the show? Mm -mm. This was a show about an orangutan that was voted into the White House. Seriously? This is 100% a real show in 1983 on NBC called Mr. Smith, where an orangutan named Mr. Smith, he can talk, is voted into the White House as president, and I think that may be the greatest American hero that year as the stupidest show. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Speaking then, of TV then, guy being president. But then, then you're just, you're, you, then you get into the point where you're just kind of impressed by how far they will go. You oh, know? yeah. Like, that is pretty far. The Flying Nun, that's pretty... Yeah. I just imagine the, the, the pitch for The Flying Nun when it was first presented to yep. the executives, you know? Well, she's got this hat. And it provides lift, and so she can fly, of course. But it's in Puerto Rico, everybody, <laughs> and it's played by Gidget. Yeah. How much money do you I mean, want to give? It me? Couldn't, it, obviously, it can't miss. But, no. the, the, but it, what you would have to—I mean, you th a lot of times the Sid and Marty Croft shows yeah. are cited as you know example of of what people on the most extreme amount of drugs making a children's yeah. show could could do. But yeah, the the, the that was all, in a way the glory of of television of that era was nothing was too stupid oh, yeah. to get. <laughs> Presented and um, uh, you know, and it was. It, I mean, I that's the thing that I realized looking through these issues was uh, just looking at the daily um, list of shows and comparing it to the experience of watching television now. Yeah, it's like you look at that, you think, okay, this is an adventure. You don't know what's going to happen next. It's all really weird, and now it's just very pedestrian. Although just as stupid, but at least it, you know you were surprised. Then. You can you can be uh, alone in your quiet shame at the stupidity of television now because you watch you watch whatever you want whenever you want and you watch by yourself. But then you kind of had to watch things in a group if you only had one TV. You sort of had to all agree that you were going to watch The Bionic Man, and uh, it, it was it was sort of a very different mentality. There are two things. There are two shows this week that I want to mention that aired this week that are beloved and sort of legendary. And one of them is The Bionic Man versus The Bionic Beast. And this was the infamous Bigfoot episode right. of The Bionic Man, where Ted Cassidy plays the Sasquatch, uh, who was Lurch on on, um, on the Adams Family. Uh, it has the Jamie Summers is in it, and I forgot that John Saxon, Stephanie Powers, and Sandy Duncan are also in this episode. And it's the episode, whenever anyone talks about The Bionic Man, this is the episode they cite. Because again, it's that craziness where they're like, all right, uh, Bionic Man's a big hit, season two, what are we gonna do? And some writer's like, Bigfoot? <laughs> And they're like, write it up. We're gonna do. We're doing this. Two. You know what? Right. Two parter. We're gonna make it a two parter. Right. Um, so I, I wanted a six million dollar man lunchbox, <laughs> like you know, like really, really bad. But, yeah. but my parents were very. Um, they didn't have the word politically correct back then, but they were, and um, so they that was too commercial for them. So um, my mother got me a lunchbox with an ecology symbol on it. <laughs> And I'm, I'm not. Where kidding. would she purchase that? At the Safeway. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know that was like you know it, it's weird to say, but that that was like you know that <coughs> message that that sent was beat me up Tuesdays and Thursdays after school. Oh yeah. Whereas Six Million Dollar Man or Chico and the Man uh, would not have sent yeah. that message. So this is this was a Or Chico and the Six Million Dollar Man, which is I would watch that any day. I my parents, my dad was big on uh, trash picking and uh, flea market shopping. Mm. So like back to school I had no say in. Like he'd just show up with clothes and it'd be like whatever clothes he got at the flea market. So one year I had a this was in nineteen eighty eight, I had a nineteen eighty four red, white and blue Adidas Olympic tracksuit. <laughs> Which probably sounds cool now, it but when you're eight cool. years old in Boston, it just means that you're going to get beat up all the time. And uh, I wanted, uh, I remember in 1985, I wanted a Pee Wee's Playhouse lunchbox, now of which I've bought three. Um, but I really wanted this desperately, and you know, it was a plastic lunchbox. 
and my dad didn't buy it, and instead he got me a, a tin lunchbox from the 70s that just said disco on it. <laughs> and it had like disco dancers, which I was like, who is this for? Like, is this a Coke box? Like, what is this possibly for? <laughs> and like, and it was made out of metal, so kids would actually hit me right. with the disco lunchbox. So I had like dented disco lunchbox. That is the worst one. Yeah. I mean, that was the, the disco sucks movement was very. Um, <laughs> It, had a, it was very powerful. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it truly was, and I, I literally suffered for it. Uh, then the other big show in here, and this is beloved by people the world over, uh, this is the debut of a show called Learn the Secrets. Uh, and that's the, not the full title. The full title is Learn the Secrets of Furniture Care. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in to Homer Formby's all-new half-hour television series as he clearly demonstrates the natural Formby techniques Learn how you can easily refinish furniture, remove water rings, cigarette burns, and build up of layers of wax. You'll see how the master of antique restoration hand rubs a finish. After, after a couple of episodes, of, or maybe three, of Say Yes to the Dress, that would be a, a welcome relief. <laughs> and, I would happily and, watch and that we don't, show. And we don't have that. We certainly don't. Is there a, a TV show that you that doesn't have a theme song that you would, would write a theme song for or that you want? I mean, I wish someone would hire me to write theme songs. That would be great. I don't think it's a job anymore. No. Um, that's a, a what, what is a? I mean, I well, you know, I wish I, I'm gonna I'm going to tell you this, um, though I cannot remember what the um, what the words were. Okay. But I used to write lyrics to some of the theme songs. Like I wrote lyrics to Ellery Queen. Um, you know, do you know the Ellery Queen no, music? No. Um, <laughs> so I did, I, and, and I don't know if you remember that show. No. Ellery Queen, that's in there okay. um, somewhere. <clears throat> Ellery Queen was a detective uh, and they're actually based on books that were written by a couple of guys whose names I can't remember that goes back to the 40s. They were detective, um, detective stories, and it was Ellery was played by Jim Hutton, and he was the son, the brilliant son of a cop in New York in the 30s, and, um, and he, was, he, was, he could always solve the crimes that the cops couldn't solve. He wore a little Sherlock Holmes hat. Um, he, was, he, was, he was brilliant, but I, I realize now, I waited for many, many years till the DVDs came out so that I could watch them again because I remembered them so fondly. And unfortunately, they all had exactly the same plot, which was that <laughs> there was a guy murdered, or a woman, or some person murdered, and then in his, the dying spasm left a clue to the killer's identity. Like, for instance, he'd pick up a rock and there'd be a rock in his hand, and it turns out that the murderer is Joe Rock, and that is exact. <laughs> that is that is the 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 extent of the mystery. The, but when I was nine, it was I was really like, wow, God, he's done it again. <laughs> of course, Joe Rock. <laughs> How did I not see that? It's like, uh, did you ever see that that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, End of Days? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, he. <laughs> He's trying to figure out this woman. The plot of this movie is that the, the Antichrist comes back, but there's a, also a, a new Christ in New York. Uh, and he, they're trying to find this girl who's actually a descendant of Jesus Christ to fight the Antichrist, as you do. And uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger plays a tough New York cop with an unexplained Austrian accent. And uh, he's, he's trying to figure it out, and he goes, what well, if her name is uh, she's Jesus Christ? She's Christ in New York. Christina York, and then they like put Christina York in the computer, and her face pops up, and that's her. Uh, yeah, he that, that's a, there, there, uh, there should be a name for that, like where there's like an incredibly obvious thing that is belabored <laughs> for for uh, far too long. Deus uh, est uh, stupida. Uh, screen time, like uh, like in the the film, um, I think it's Angel Heart, where yeah. um, where the the key to the whole mystery is the man named Louis Cipher. Yep, is Lucifer, and so the way yeah. that this is figured, Louis Cipher, Louis oh. Cipher, Louis yeah. Cipher, Lucifer. Oh my God! Yeah, that's and, after two hours of yeah, voodoo. And and and, and um, there's some. That's again, your the experience of watching it is personally humiliating. Yeah, but that is the essence of the art. Yeah. So it's like it's it's like they are actually, it's a it's a fuck you to the audience. <laughs> 
I feel like it's just I someone really, who wanted to go home which early. I can really relate to. Because it's, it's like a writer being like, ah, oh, man, you know what? Louis Cipher, I'm, I'm going on vacation. It's Friday afternoon. <laughs> Forget it. But that, that movie, too, with Lisa Bonet was in. I don't know if anyone's ever seen that movie. It's Mickey Rourke and Lisa Bonet. And Lisa Bonet has this uh, sex scene where it's raining blood Slayer style in this, in this uh, room. And weirdly turns out to have... <laughs> Mickey Rourke's supposed to be her father, which we find out later. And the scene is with him. But that's the reason why she got fired from The Cosby Show. She had made this movie over right? the summer, and uh, Bill Cosby was like, I won't have that kind of behavior. <laughs> I don't even know so, what joke you make to that now. Yeah, yeah you're just like, nope. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so then she left, and then she married Lenny Kravitz. But um, there is uh, The Muppet Show in here, which was everything. And such a, a ahead of its time show, uh, 76, I believe, was the first year. Uh, this is, again, Sandy Duncan, who I really hate. But she is the, uh, oh, yeah, oh, oh I'm Sandy Duncan. She's got her finger in every pie. Oh, God. One, she has one real eye, which always weirded me out. I don't, know why, I don't know why, but the fact that she has a glass eye really freaked me out. And uh, she replaced Valerie on The Hogan Family, and I'll never forgive her. Um, but she is the guest on, on this episode of The Muppet Show, and they get a full-page ad, and they're not really aiming it at kids. And it's a very funny ad that is uh, written just for the, the ad copy, but in the sort of voice and style of The Muppets, and it's so consistent and funny. It's very strange that they would do that. You know, Alice Cooper appeared on The Muppets that year, which is really right. bizarre when you think about it. Uh, it should be, because they were shooting it in England, which a lot of people didn't know. And I didn't know that. The amazing thing about Jim Henson, um, who, to get back to hippies, Jim Henson is my favorite and only kind of hippie that I enjoy, which was that like kind of fuck you hippie, was like, fuck you guys, you're ruining everything. Don't you understand? Like that kind of hippie. And he was so <laughs> subversive. And the... The show, no one would air The Muppet Show. No one wanted to put it on any network. They pitched it to every network. And so he discovered that this new syndication market, which is what you know, the reruns of Gilligan's Island and all the things we were watching were playing on, didn't have any new content. So he said, if I can make a new show and sell it directly into the syndication, it will do well. So he had it produced in England. An English company funded it. And then he sold it into syndication. And he invented that whole channel of, of mm. syndicating first-run shows for The Muppet Show. Like, the guy was an absolutely brilliant businessman, uh, but he also booked Sandy Duncan on this show. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't know. Speaking of Sandy Duncan, have you ever eaten Wheat Thins lately? Because uh, she was, the, she was yeah. the spokesmodel for Wheat Thins. Yeah. And um, I remember <laughs> liking Wheat Thins... Uh, quite a lot, despite her. Um, I was a Triscuits guy. Yeah, me too. Triscuits, I mean, yeah. you know, don't get me wrong, Triscuits are better, but uh, <laughs> recently we got some Wheat Thins and I, I, I ate some and they're really horrible. Like, yeah, they're awful. They're like yeah. way worse than I, than I thought. They taste like healthy communion wafers. <laughs> like, like these communion wafers are too fat. They're too, they're, they're sugary. That's the problem yeah. with it. You know, yeah. They're, yeah it's but they're a, baked, not fried. Shut up, Sandy Duncan. She would advertise anything. She would do right. like Midas mufflers and uh, Jack in the Box. She was, she was the Shaquille O'Neal of her day. You remember she the, would be in any ad. <laughs> that you, remember, her. you remember the, the, the band Sandy Duncan's Eye? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, yes. Um, that, so that, that, uh, if nothing else, that justifies That's her true. Existence. That was around the time when Eve's Plum was also yeah, playing quite a bit, uh, who played Marsha Brady. I mean, not Marsha Brady, Jan Brady, Jan. which is a cadence and speaking style that I occasionally get stuck in. Jan? Jan Brady, which is like, ah, ha, ah, ah. Like, it's, you just only speak on the out breath, and it's sort of, it's not really whiny, and it's almost sort of cosmopolitan mid-Atlantic. Right. If you, uh, you've never, I've, I've talked to you a bit, you've never done it I would get it if you said if you started that it was Jan Brady. Yeah, but I was like, like, Frank, did you ever watch Peretta? It's right, like and, that kind and of and like, you're, like you're on the verge of bursting into tears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, but also kind of angry too. Like, like it's an urgent question that I have for you, and I'm almost gonna cry, but I also don't care. <laughs> That is so, that captures exactly the essence <laughs> of Jan Brady. Middle child. Uh, also, and this is a side note again, I don't want me to get political here, but everyone has accused uh, Donald Trump of gaslighting America, which he is. But uh, I, I said that's too much of a compliment to him because that implies that he can form uh, a thought that is strategic. So I have dubbed it George Glasslighting. 
because it's just made up bullshit. And so Marsha had the George Glass boyfriend where she was like, I have a boyfriend, George. George Glass. And right. so everything I hear him say sounds like he's just George Glass in it at any time. Right. Like he's going to take a fake phone call and be like, oh, he's on the phone right now. Oh, it's George Glass. You can talk to him. Yeah, nobody, I'll continue to keep that to myself. <laughs> so as we move through the week here and, and wrap this up, there's, there's a new episode of Beretta. And Beretta starred another murderer, Robert Blake. Um, um, Although I don't know if we brought a murderer up earlier in the show, but I always just like to say another just in case I forgot. Um, but this episode, Robert Blake played a cop whose best friend was a cockatoo. <laughs> and he was, he was like a, because that was the thing, they called it the defective detective genre. Because yeah. they all had like a thing that was wrong with them, you know. Uh, like Telly Savalas was Satan and, um, uh, you know, like Banachek was a jerk or like whatever it was. Um, and, this one, he had this cockatoo that would like ride around on his shoulder. And this might be my favorite summary of a cop show in this whole issue. New season, Kung Fu Hitman on a rampage. Beretta goes all out to find a mysterious oriental killer and find somebody going all out to murder him. Yeah, that's Beretta. Yeah, but Robert Blake came to a bad end. Yeah, he's, he's still alive. Yeah. And a friend of mine knew him. They were on shows together, and she sees him in her local Whole Foods all the time and ignores him and felt bad about it. And I'm like, it's okay to ignore murderers. Like, that's okay. He knows you know. I'm sure he's fine. <laughs> Everybody knows. It's like, he's okay if you're not going to say hello to Robert Blake. Um, we have the premiere of All in the Family where uh, Archie gains a girlfriend and loses Edith. This was a big one. Uh, Archie's interest in a local waitress as a possible side dish to his romantic diet doesn't go down well with Edith. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, what a... What a selfish person she is. <laughs> uh, and a serious crisis engulfs the Bunker household. Uh, special guest star is Janice Page, who plays this side dish. Um, but you would never have that on us. Like, Love American Style mm -hmm. and Love Boat, too. Like, every episode of Love Boat, there was a plot about a, a, a married couple whose marriage was saved by infidelity. <laughs> every single time, it was like, we uh, hate each yeah. other. We both cheated. <clears throat> now we love each other. And you would well, never you know, get this. this is something that, I, that is incidentally that you bring up that I think is a difference between then and now across the board culturally is that uh, the uh, idea of, uh, you know, protagonists, characters who have, who do bad things or have some flaw is not tolerated by audiences now, or at least if you have, if you as I'm a writer, I'm a novelist as well, believe it or not, um, and, King Dork, approximately. And, Fantastic. And, yeah, and uh, the, you, you, if any, if you write a book where any of your characters do anything remotely questionable, then you get called on it on the internet. You know, it's like <laughs> how dare, how, and it's like it's a work of fiction. It's meant you can you you can talk about what the the reasons for this till you're blue in the face, but it's just really terrible. This this book was really <laughs> funny, but I just don't like how that. How, how Susie went down the stairs to... Uh, when to she fight. had no right to do so. Yeah, and it's like they're, they're, they're extremely moralistic. And the, the idea yeah. of a television show where, um, where, the, where that kind of thing would go on, even though that description is really hilarious. Yeah, but he's having a um, crisis yeah, of marriage. I can't, I can't, I don't, you don't think that would... I can't imagine We that sort of do exactly. now... The only way you can get away with it is if your characters are nothing but deplorable. Like if it's always something in Philadelphia, always something in Philadelphia or yeah. Seinfeld, where mm. your characters aren't good people who have one flaw, they're just bad people all the time, then everybody's okay with it because it's, it sort of makes them more cartoonish, you know? Right, yeah, but I mean, I, I, I think that, that uh, I don't know what to attribute it to, but it's something that you notice across the board. You notice it with songs as well. Nobody seems to be able to grasp that you can write a song where the narrator is not identical to you as the singer right. or the songwriter. And that, that is that all the time. I, you know, I, uh, I, wrote a, I, wrote, I wrote a song, it's one of my most popular songs, weirdly, called Deep Deep Down, which is based on a, um, a story that happened in Berkeley when I was in college where um, these, these kids went, um, went out jogging and the boyfriend killed the girlfriend and buried her in the, in the, uh, in the canyon. And um, so that's what this is about. It's about, it's, it's in the, the, from the point of view, it's a murder ballad. This is a thing that goes back, you know, uh, 
many, many years it's in a thing. songwriting. <laughs> yeah. And um, so but one of the weird things that happens, a lot of people think of this song as a very romantic love song. I actually had people, you know, tell me they play at their, play it at their wedding and things like that. Um, and then they grow up a little bit and they pay attention to it more. <laughs> and they say, wait a minute, this song is about a murder. And then the thing they say, they say is not um, reflecting on how, on that, Boy, that I was situation. stupid. They, they say, well, so you actually murdered someone and buried it in a canyon. <laughs> that must have been weird. And that there, there's a... There this is, is a confession, a, right? Yeah. I there, cracked the case. <laughs> it, it's it's a just astounding. I think it's yeah. more the case now than it ever was. And it's weird that it comes out in reading a description about Archie Bunker's... What is it? What was the Infidel word? Side dish. Side dish. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, like no one's like I the guy who... I got to start using that Got a little side dish. Uh, it's dish. like saying that the guy who wrote the Bionic Man Bigfoot episode was like, remember that time you were Bionic and you killed Bigfoot? <laughs> no, that's exactly He's right. Like, no, I just wrote a show. I'm like, why would you kill him? He's endangered. That's awful. Uh, so <laughs> to wrap up here, um, is there anything that you watch now? Or is there like a show you're addicted to? or that? Are there any shows from your youth that you revisit? Um, I mean, I get like nostalgia, like, um, like everyone. Uh, the, the show that... Probably the, the show that I loved as a kid that seems to hold up the most now is the Bob Newhart show, oh, where yeah. um, that comedy still works yeah. way, like way better than you could imagine and way better than anything. And I, I still revisit that. I mean, right now, I'm really, although I'm not so wild about this current season, I love the concept of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and the, um, I really envy that Fountains of Wayne guy having that job of basically writing three, two to three songs for a drama. I would yeah. love, I wish someone would hire me to do that. But I, 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 I love that idea. I hope they do more of that kind of thing. It is interesting seeing the musical genre on TV actually do well uh, when they tried so many times. They have tried. Cop Rock. Cop Rock is the infamous <laughs> one. But there was yeah. Hull High as well, which is actually a really good show that only lasted six episodes. And uh, Kenny Ortega, who created uh, High School Musical, uh, created that show. Mm. And, it, and it was a huge bomb. And then 20 years later, he's like, no, this is a new idea, and then it, it works. So it's, I don't know what it is about popular culture that now people are okay with musicals in sort of narrative TV, but. Yeah, it's, it's a thing. I mean, I, what, what I hope is that it, that it grows rather than just fades away, because it's, it's, it's at least something interesting going on that's more interesting than just the trying on dresses and the trying to sell things at pawn shops and whatever else programming is. How I much this? prefer. Frank, it's a show about a bunch of fat guys and they hunt for dresses in the woods and then they sell the dresses to pawn shops. Look, if there was, a, if there was some songs and production numbers that were well written, I would be very much in favor of it. Well, I think you and I should start working on that. We can pitch this show. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out to the Live TV Guidance Council. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Frank for doing the show. So nice, you guys. Thanks to SF Sketch Fest. And uh, we'll see you around. Thanks. There you go, live SF Sketchfest. Had a great time. Thanks again to Frank for doing it and for Sketchfest for having us. Uh, I cannot thank Cole and Janet and everyone there enough for giving me the opportunity to be out there. Uh, I've only, the first time I ever went to San Francisco was earlier last year, and this was only my second time there, and I loved it. So thank you guys so much. Hopefully I will be out there again soon. Hopefully we'll have some more live TV guidance counselors coming up in the future, uh, assuming we have a future as a species, but that's an entirely different conversation that I won't get into now. You can find Frank. Uh, I'll put up all his social media stuff on tvguidancecounselor.com. You can buy his books, which I highly recommend, uh, albums, all that kind of thing. You can find me at tvguidancecounselor.com, or you can email me at tvguidancecounselor at gmail.com, or at can at iCanRead.com. iCanRead.com being my stand-up comedy page where you can purchase my albums, where you can really purchase those anywhere uh, if you want to. You don't have to. Or you can 
go to our Facebook page. Just search TV Guidance Counselor or on Twitter. We are at TV Guidance. Uh, love hearing from you guys. If you have guest requests or any sort of comments about the show or questions about television, I am happy to do my best to answer them for you. As always, we have a new episode every Wednesday. I've said, as always, way too many times this episode, and I apologize. I am on cold medicine and jet lagged. But uh, brand new episodes each and every Wednesday and new episodes sometimes on Fridays or other days. So be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes so you don't miss an episode. And if you like the show, please rate and review it. It is a huge help. So we'll see you again next time on TV Guidance Counselor. Well, she's got this hat. And it provides lift. And so she can fly, of course. Of course.